Welcome to Poland Daily History with me, Nicholas Richardson. In this series of episodes, we're going to be looking at Polish history from a British perspective and also Anglo-Polish relations in a geopolitical context. And I'm delighted to have with me in the studio today Richard Barclay, who is half Polish. He's been living in Poland for 20 years and is able to bring a unique perspective onto this subject. Interestingly, I've, I'm just reading a wonderful new book by, um, uh, his name is Walker, Alan Walker, uh, on Chopin, and it really is absolutely the authority, authoritative publication on, on Chopin. And, of course, Chopin did go to England once, um, and he was well received. But what's interesting is the Polish view of the English to come out, and the English were regarded as cold, uncultured, arrogant, um, uh, isolationist, <laughs> you know. Well, I think if you come from, a, yeah, and this is a, again, this is a this is a, a very continental European approach to talk about little Englanders. Yes, yeah. uh, shopkeepers even. If there's a, yes, well, that's fine. But if there's any nation which cannot be described as small, it's the it's the British because we have been as a nation to more parts of the world and done more things than anybody else. And it's really the, it's particularly the German sort of obsession with this. Oh, I call them little middle Europeans, you know, the, the, this obsession with Germany and, and just the bits around yes. Germany. Whereas we've always taken a more global view. Well, uh, yes, you may say that, but we took a global view in order to conquer. Whereas the Chinese, if you think of Admiral Zheng He in the, in the 14th century, who had these massive ships, nine masters, with thousand people on, you know, they had even ship farms to allow this great fleet to go around the world. He didn't go around the world with cannon and, 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 and soldiers and uh, with ideas of domination. Uh, he went around the world giving presents to people and getting presents in return. You know, he brought a, uh, he brought a, a, a giraffe from Mogadishu and gave it to the emperor of China. Um, uh, unfortunately, you see, much of, much of, you see, I think we are slightly deluded into thinking that we uh, serve the world as a, as a benign uh, patrician sort of uh, state. We were not. I mean, the East India Company, which was the most ruthless uh, uh, corporate organization ever to exist on the face of the earth. I oh, mean, indeed, yes. Uh, it was they who raped and pillaged Bengal, the greatest industrial manufacturing area anywhere on earth. It was they who traded opium in order to destroy the Chinese empire. Uh, everything that we, 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 everywhere we look that, is, that was pink was really as a result of the most brutal brutal form of capitalism, of corporate capitalism. And uh, really, you know, Procter & Gamble and Unilever and all these very second-rate companies today could, could take, if they really wanted to be corporate raiders, they could take a they lesson out, out, of, out of the but East India just, Company, uh, yeah, uh, which had to be nationalised uh, in the course, end, if you remember. And, and then thinking, a, a great case for nationalisation. Yes, and yes. think about sort of Anglo-Polish relations, because then I think the next period where it actually becomes very interesting is once Poland has been re-established after the First World mm. War, and then, of course, with the Soviet-Polish Wars, Versailles, yes. and, and then the, um, the, the 1921 um, um, Treaty yes. of Riga, which then really established and kept the, kept the Russians out of Europe. We then enter this they rather did. interesting 20-year 20 20 period betwixt the wars. And, of course, this is, I think, when Polish-British relations then sort of become interesting again, because it ultimately led to this, this guarantee which, which the British and the French gave, um, to Poland in the event of the, uh, the end of Germany, and the British invading. kept their side of the bargain. Yes, they declared war on Germany. They did, and this is something that Poles don't understand. Uh, between the 1920s and 19, uh, 1939, uh, the British really hoped that war was behind them. Yeah, and I think, I think, and I think yes, and I think it's very important to note in this context that many of those people making the decisions in the British government and other had governments suffered terribly. Had, had themselves been, you know, we, we had been in the First World War. At, at Ypres, yes, yeah, at all I mean, these... I, you know, for example, Anton Eden, who's a foreign secretary during, yeah, during the Second World Macmillan, everybody. Um, Eden and Macmillan. Eden had actually fought in the same... Churchill himself. Yes. Eden had fought in the same battle as, as Hitler. Yeah. Eden lost two brothers in the First yeah, World yeah, War. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you can understand they would do absolutely anything to try and avoid a war. Anything again. to avoid a war. And the other thing that is very interesting is the, the role of Russia in, in, in Western thinking. Now, if you, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at Lenin, for example, Lenin and his worldview was basically this. No, sorry, Hitler. Hitler and his worldview was basically this. You had Wall Street and you had Moscow. And they were both equally bad. They were both 
uh, in his very primitive view of the world, Jewish-dominated empires. Uh, and his view of the world, which was shared by many people in the English, the English upper classes, uh, uh, detracted or distracted Western politicians from what was happening in Germany. They were wholly focused on the Soviet threat. Yes. yes. And the Soviet threat uh, really led, actually, the, I mean, this, this, this complete absorption with what Russia was doing and what the... What, and, of course, you know, why did, the, why did the King George V, why did he allow Nicholas II to be killed? Why didn't he save him? He was afraid. They were afraid of the revolution. Of they were course. afraid they of the, import, the yes. They were afraid of the reaction the people would be. Exactly right. To, which is actually was probably a mistake. I mean, because you know the British are not really very. We're not a really very revolutionary people. No, but today, today Nicholas would, would be. Well, I don't know. We did execute the king. Uh, we did. We we did have a, re a republic, if you remember, for a while. For a while. Yeah. Um, and um, we uh, we. We can we can be revolutionary. I mean, we do do, I mean, but we learn our we learn our lessons quickly. So that's the other thing that really annoys me is the way that the people talk about the French Revolution. But we did it a hundred years before without actually killing too many people. Without killing too many people, no. I mean, we did chop the king's head off, which um, which was pretty shocking in those days. Actually, the Lord's anointed. Uh, people honestly expected there was a great gasp when his head was chopped off. You know, I can imagine, yes. and people really expected the world to stop. The fact that it didn't.